Sir Richard, Jeff Bezos, but there ain't no way Musk go into orbit. But don't be sad, don't be sad, cause building a starship ain't bad. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All, so yeah, please forgive that. <laughs> I don't know why. I was thinking billionaires in space, and I thought, wow, why not do uh, you know a little homage to Meatloaf's two out of three ain't bad, because it's three billionaires. Anyway, so yeah, as I'm sure everyone knows, Sir Richard Branson on Sunday went into uh, space, not orbit. He went to, well, he went to the edge of space. He went to 80 kilometers. Many people say 100 kilometers is the Kármán line, and so therefore it's actual space, so there's some debate about that, but, you know, regardless. Uh, he went in, experienced weightlessness for four minutes, beat Jeff Bezos by a period of time, by about, I think, nine days, I think that's what it is. Anyway, and, and Jeff Bezos next week is going to go into space if everything goes well in the new Shepard rocket. And of course, in the meantime, while Elon Musk has no immediate plans to go into space himself, although I'm sure he could purchase a ride on either Virgin Galactic or New Shepard, and honestly, I, th I think he was actually there at uh, Richard Branson's inaugural flight, so actually he might end up doing that, who knows. There, there, I'm sure there's some iffiness to this, and in fact, it's quite clear that Jeff Bezos stepped down as the CEO of Amazon specifically because of this space launch. They didn't want, uh, you know, the CEO of this massive major company being in space and taking a risk to his life that, you know, although honestly that thing seems so safe that I don't think it's any more dangerous than taking a private jet at this point. But anyway, I'm sure that had a major, major part to do with Jeff Bezos stepping down as CEO of Amazon. But at any rate, I know that Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos have like some issues with each other. So it's unlikely that, that Elon Musk would ask to, uh, you know, get a ride on a new Shepard rocket, but there's a very high degree of chance that he would want to go on Spaceship Two at some point. Although again, the issue is that Elon Musk is the CEO of not just one, not just two, but three major companies and is involved in more companies. So, you know, <laughs> the likelihood that he would be allowed by his board of directors to do something as, you know, foolish as going into space and risking his life is unlikely. So, you know, the good thing for, um, for Elon Musk is that he's a very young man. He's just in his early 50s. So, you know, he could easily be CEO for the next 10 years. And then he could take his own rocket into space at some point. Because after all, SpaceX is setting up for space tourism starting this fall. And then it's going to go even more crazy with the Dear Moon launch sometime. <laughs> Who knows exactly when that's going to happen, but certainly the Inspiration4 mission is going to happen, I believe in September is the goal at this point, so we can actually still count that as summertime, right? Because June 21st to September 21st approximately is the summer, so this is really kind of the summer of billionaires. So if, if things go well this summer, already we have Sir Richard Branson has gone to the edge of space. Jeff Bezos in just a few days from now will go into space, and he will cross the Kármán line, so he'll, you know, officially with no questions asked, be uh, considered to be an astronaut, I guess, uh, and his brother as well. And then Elon Musk will be sending the Inspiration4 mission if things go well during the summertime period. So a lot of space tourism, a lot of really cool stuff from the billionaire population <laughs> around the world. It's very cool. Honestly, this was a thing when I thought when I was a child, you know, and I had no idea because I was like, well, I could become a billionaire someday, right? And it's not going to happen at this point. But I thought if I became a billionaire, because they talked about how it cost $25 billion to put uh, Apollo on the moon, and of course that's adjusted money, it's much, much more than that now if you adjust for inflation, but I thought to myself, well, it's not out of the question that an individual or a couple of individuals could come up with that kind of money and why not invest it into space? I, you know, I've always been that big of a space nerd. I've been like, why not invest private money in addition to governmental money? And so I'm extremely happy to see what has taken place in terms of these billionaires actually putting their money where their mouth is. Now, a lot of people poke fun at both Virgin Galactic and at Blue Origin because they say they're just kind of, you know, they're going up and down. They're doing a, not not even a ballistic shot, it's just straight up and down, honestly. Um, the, 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 honestly, I kind of like the uh, the Virgin Galactic better. I think it's really cool that they're flying a spaceship, a, a, a space plane that actually feathers and, you know, Burt Rattan and Scale Composites, who designed this original design, were pretty much geniuses to be able to create this thing that works so amazingly as a glider too. It's very, very cool how it comes back down to the runway and everything. So. 
I guess if I had my druthers, I would probably pick that one over the Blue Origin New Shepherd if I had, you know, I think it's a quarter million dollars or something. So <laughs> that's never going to happen. But, you know, in another 10 years, and I'm only 56, so, you know, that as long as I stay in reasonable health, in 10 years, the price might come down to something reasonable. And, you know, if, gosh, I don't know if it's 40 or $50,000, maybe at some point I could scrape together that kind of money. I don't know quite how. I guess I could just cash in my retirement and just go do that. My wife might be, misinformation might be a little pissed about that. But anyway, I think it's really cool that we have now opened up what should be floodgates to space tourism. There are many, many, there are not very many people like Dennis Tito, who can come up with, you know, multi-million dollars. I think he spent $25 million to go on the Soyuz uh, to go into space. So there's not very many people who can do that. But when you start bringing it down into the hundreds of thousands of dollars, there are many people on the planet who have that kind of disposable cash. Obviously, people buy Bugattis and they buy Ferraris and they buy very expensive houses. So clearly they've got that kind of money. And so you start to open that up to many more people. And then if you can get sub $100,000 eventually to do these suborbital hops, that really starts to open it up. So anyway, I'm not saying anything bad about these straight up and down shots. They're really, really cool. They do exactly what they're supposed to do. And of course, Virgin has Virgin Orbital as well, which is a really cool small sat launcher, which kind of, it goes on the belly of a plane. It's sort of like White Knight and Spaceship Two, except that it's just a regular 747 with kind of a missile attached underneath it that drops off the, the wing of the 747 and takes off and goes into orbit. So going into orbit is much, much, much more difficult than going into space because going into space, you only have to have enough velocity to get out of the Earth's atmosphere and then you fall back down again. Going into orbit means going up that high but much more importantly, instead of going zero kilometers per hour sideways, it's around 25,000 kilometers per hour sideways. So they don't do it like this, but you can imagine a trajectory where you go up to around 100 kilometers or so, and then you have to give yourself all of that sideways velocity, right? Because you're, you're falling. In space, orbit just means you're falling, but you're missing the Earth all the time because you're going fast enough that you keep going around instead of coming back and hitting the Earth. So, uh, so anyway, much, much, much more energy involved in getting into orbit than getting into space. But certainly, Blue Origin's new Glenn is planning on going into orbit, of course, with a very, very massive rocket. And Virgin Orbital is already doing orbital shots. And of course, SpaceX has been doing orbital missions for many, many years. And of course, they've actually done a couple of crewed missions, but of course, those aren't tourism and those are actually NASA-funded missions. And of course, SpaceX is working on the Starship, and the Super Heavy, by the way, just looks incredibly massive. The pictures of it next to the Star Hopper. I mean, I went down to South Texas when Star Hopper and Serial Number 15 were together, and Serial Number 15 dwarfed the Star Hopper, but they were still kind of on the same scale. But now the image where you look at the Star Hopper versus the Super Heavy booster, it's just amazing how small the Star Hopper looks. And then I can't even imagine when they actually stack the the next Starship serial number 20, I believe, or something like that, on top of the Super Heavy. It's going to be ridiculous. I'm going to have to get back down there to see it because it's just kind of mind-blowing, even to see the pictures. And I have a feeling seeing it in person is going to be even more mind-blowing. So definitely I'm going to get back down there when they stack them. If I get lucky, maybe I'll see a static fire or even a launch. That would be super cool. But anyway, so, you know, Musk et al. are, they're not messing around with these suborbital hops. They're straight into the orbital thing, and Inspiration4 will be their first sort of commercial only uh, launch, at least in terms of crewed passengers, etc. So anyway, so everybody's getting into the game and doing tourism in space. It's an amazing thing. I think it's just so cool that the, the future that we kind of dreamed of in the late 60s into the 70s, and it kind of died in the 70s because the space shuttle, I don't know, anybody who's as old as I am and was a space nerd as a child will definitely remember that the dream of Apollo, it was so crisp and so, you know, in your face when I was a child in the late 60s, early 70s. And then it just, you know, the space shuttle, which was already a big compromise because it wasn't going back to the moon. It wasn't exploring anything. It was just going up into space. It was more like a truck. <laughs> it was like a U-Haul. It was going from uh, a hand-built, um, you know, muscle car or something that somebody had put together with duct tape and wire, chewing gum, etc. right? That was what Apollo was. And it was an amazing thing. And it had incredible capabilities and so cutting edge and bleeding edge, but then it was going from that to a U-Haul truck. So it just wasn't all that exciting for us kids who were born, you know, into that 
era. So in the 70s, the, the passion for space around the, the world, and I probably by the late 60s already, that had died back. So it was very disappointing. But I certainly, as a child, read all the science fiction that I could. I'm actually rereading Isaac Asimov's Foundation series as a way of getting back into it because they're releasing it. Oh gosh, is it on Disney? I can't remember. No, I think it's on Apple TV. Anyway, <laughs> I'll put a, I'll post what, what thing it's on, what service it's on below. But I got really excited about that and I'm going back and rereading it and realizing how much influence uh, Asimov had on, on Frank Herbert, by the way. Gosh, you know, it just seems like the Dune series is just based out of, right? He just stole the Foundation universe and kind of created the Dune universe out of it. Uh, but anyway, not only that, but of course, you know, so you've got Asimov that I read when I was a child. You've got Frank Herbert that I read with, when I was a child. You've got Larry Niven and Ringworld, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, all of these things influenced me a ton as a child, but all of it was kind of based on this easy access to space. And it's only in 2021 that we're finally getting back to that vision. We're finally getting to the place where I can actually see human beings being able to go to space easily in the sense of it being a relatively common thing. In fact, my wife asked me about that. She said, well, that's great that Richard Branson went to space, but that's just a one-off kind of thing. And I said, no, the deal is that, you know, I think the goal is for them to be launching multiple of those per week, especially when they get Spaceship 3 operating as well. So, you know, they're looking at multiple of those per week and then Blue Origin. I don't know what their plans are in terms of how many of these new Shepherds they're going to build, but they'll also be doing many, many launches per year. So again, the cost will come down. And then of course, SpaceX with their orbital launches, which will always be much more expensive because it's a much bigger rocket. They got to go a lot faster, etc. cetera. Uh, but they will also be doing many of these commercial launches as well. So we've opened up the world World, two commercial launches into space. It's very nice that the US government at least is friendly to it, and it seems like most other governments around the world are fairly friendly to this as well. So I, I, I you know, I appreciate the fact that the US is taking the lead in this again, but I do hope it becomes kind of a global thing and that ESA and certainly it would be nice if China would do this and Roscosmos. I guess Russia was the originator, originator right? They were the ones who, who originally set up space tourism after the fall of the Soviet Union to get money, but it was a very, very ethereal, you know, only a very, very few people could afford it and also be in the kind of shape they needed to be. And certainly was not a comfortable ride. Soyuz is a pretty cramped space to fit three people into. So all of these other suborbital things are much more like kind of human things, right? You can spend a couple of days to do this instead of a year training and millions and millions of dollars. So it's a much more of a one-off, kind of like, uh, I would imagine it's like a, a, a skydiving or something, right? It's like you pay the money, you do your training for a day or two, and then you go up and you do the skydiving. So you can do that. And of course you can go back again if you want to, but the, the actual experience only takes a few days as opposed to months or years in order to train to get ready for these much more ambitious orbital flights. And of course, not to forget about SpaceX. SpaceX is going to be sending up, they say in July, it's not gonna happen in July, I almost guarantee that. Uh, I, if they stack the two on top of each other in July, that'll be pretty amazing. But they're planning on doing a suborbital flight, almost orbital flight of Super Heavy and Starship, which will launch from Boca Chica, Texas, and will go just through the Caribbean, just south of Florida, and kind of thread its way through the Caribbean islands as it gets up. The Super Heavy will fall back into the Gulf of Mexico. Unclear whether they're going to recover it or not. It's going to do a soft landing, or at least they'll try to do a soft landing just on the water, just to test out all of those systems. Uh, and then the actual Starship itself will go around the planet almost once and will re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and do, again, hopefully a soft landing in the ocean near Kauai. I think about 60 miles northeast is what I heard, or 100 kilometers northeast of Kauai in Hawaii. Uh, very, very open area, <laughs> you know, they have a lot of room for error there and if something goes wrong, because there's there's a good chance that the Starship will not survive re-entry because it's going to be at very, very high speed and it will produce a ton of heat and who knows if all the heat tiles that they'll have put on will survive, etc. So anyway, I'm sure that SpaceX, what they're looking for is to try to get a launch without an explosion, that would be a good thing, and then to get the Super Heavy and Starship to separate, that would be a good thing, and then to see how the Starship vacuum engines work in space, that would be a good thing to get it around the Earth and back and to try to do the re-entry. And if they can get the re-entry and the soft touchdown in the ocean, that's like all that they need. But if they get even parts of this to work, that will all be huge stuff. Of course, it's going to be very expensive because they're going to be getting rid of, I believe it's 27 engines on Super Heavy to start with and also six on Starship. So that is, you know, 33 of these Raptor engines that they're building are going to be 
demolished in this, even if it's completely successful. So it's going to be very expensive, but it's an amazing first step and it's very, very bold. It reminds me of the Apollo era when they did the Apollo all up test, when they, you know, instead of testing pieces like the Germans, you know, under Werner von Braun, were very much into testing each component and doing it all separately. But because of the Cold War and the really, really fast pace they had to do, the first Apollo launch, the first Saturn V launch, excuse me, was actually an all up test where they just put all of the pieces together and they launched them at once. Of course, with dummy payloads at the top, but the, the first stage, second stage, third stage were all fueled, they all worked properly, and it was an amazing success. But of course, that was a very, very risky strategy. Well, it seems like what SpaceX is doing right now is they're taking that same sort of bold move. Hopefully not because they have desperation. The angry astronaut, and I'll link his video in the description, did a whole video about how SpaceX could be in commercial trouble right now, that they might be having issues in terms of funding, in terms of money, and that's one of the reasons why they've pushed the schedule so hard. I, I sincerely hope that is not the case, and I hope SpaceX is doing very, very well financially, but you have to look at it. Starship is taking a huge amount of money, and also Starlink is taking a huge amount of money, and they're not making any money out of these things yet, right? So they've got a manifest of things that they're launching on their Falcon 9s, but that's the only money that's actually coming in. And of course, the $2.9 billion that NASA awarded them for the lunar lander has been held up in court because of Blue Origin and because of Dynetics. So there's a lot of stuff going on, and so SpaceX actually might might be a little bit thin on the cash front. I would hope that they could attract investors at this point if they need to. But again, you know, Elon Musk never talked about how close Tesla came to going out of business until well after it happened, after the ramp of the Model 3. So <laughs> we're going bankrupt, maybe not going out of business, but at least going bankrupt. So hopefully SpaceX is in much more healthy financial shape than that. But I have noticed that they've really cut back on their Starlink launches. I know they've filled up a shell, so they may not need to be launching them right now and they're starting to do polar ones. So there may be other reasons, but it is a little bit scary that that could be happening. But anyway, hopefully they're perfectly healthy financially and this will keep going because it's super, super exciting. So anyway, by the end of the summer, we should have Virgin Galactic, which has already gone to space once. Hopefully they will also have tourists, like paid tourists in the next flight and that will happen this summer as well. We'll also have Blue Origin and Jeff Bezos and passengers on that. That will be really, really cool and that should happen very, very soon. So that will put them in business. And then of course we should have the Inspiration4 on a Falcon 9, which I believe is going to happen before the end of the technical summer. And as as well, hopefully the Starship will also launch before the end of the summer, although I think it's more likely that that will probably take till the end of the year to do its suborbital, you know, almost around the globe type of, of launch. But we will see how this all goes. But in all events, you can see how these three billionaires are changing the world of space and it's all sort of coalescing into the summer of 2021. I couldn't be more happy about all of this stuff, I guess, unless I was going to space myself. But aside from that, I couldn't be more happy about all of this. I think it's just a fantastic thing that they're doing. I can't wait to get back to Texas and see the new status of the Starship and the Super Heavy and everything. And in the meantime, I'm super excited to keep watching these launches and I hope you are too. All right, I hope you found this episode fun and informative, and I hope you appreciated my little uh, verse at the beginning. Gosh, please don't unsubscribe because of that. I swear I won't do it again for a while. <laughs> I can't help myself singing once in a while. Anyway, if you did, please do like the video because that's how YouTube's algorithm works. And of course, consider subscribing if you do enjoy this kind of content. As always, a huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon. Again, you can see things are not completely unpacked yet, but we're getting there. So thank you all for your patience and your support uh, financially and emotionally and on Discord, etc. I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much. And for those of you interested in investing, check out Webull, an amazing platform for buying and selling stocks, and now cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Dogecoin, and others. Open an account and get a free stock valued at up to $200, and fund your account and get another free stock valued at up to $1,600. Check out the link in the description and help the channel at the same time. Thank you. And don't forget about our merch store, which now has physics is the law, everything else is a recommendation, which is a quote by Elon Musk, as well as other t-shirts, mugs, tumblers, etc., etc. Check it out in the description. And finally, don't forget we are both Tesla and Amazon affiliates. If you look in the description, you can see how clicking on a link and going shopping for a car, a solar roof, a power wall, or anything on Amazon helps out the channel. And of course, feel free to ask me questions in the comments or at my email address, which is drknowitallknows at gmail.com. Till next time, bye-bye.